Welcome to today's Employer Insights with uh, Personalis. Uh, on behalf of the Career Center, we have Patrick Harris and Juan Vasquez of the Employer Engagement Team and Kristen Keller, Career Counselor of Health and Human Services. But we also have two guests of Personalis today if they'd like to introduce themselves. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you so much for the introduction. It is an absolute pleasure for us to be here today. Uh, my name is Satsuki Shumi, um, but please feel free to call me Suki, and I am the diversity recruiter for Personalis. And I'd like to introduce you to my colleague, Ian. Hello, everyone. My name is Ian. I'm a scientist at uh, Personalis, and I'm also the DNA member at Personalis. Uh, I was uh, growing up in, you know, San Jose, so, you know, SJU is, you know, part of my community and my home, so I feel very honored and welcome to be here to um, answer and introduce, answer some of your questions and introduce uh, personalists to you guys. Thank you both. Um, and Kristen, would you be open to introducing yourself as well to people who may not know you yet? Sure. Thanks, Patrick. My name is Kristen Keller, and I am a career counselor here at uh, San Jose State. I specialize in working with students who are studying health and human services, and I'm just really excited to be here and exposing our students to opportunities at a company like this one. So thank you for having me. Thank you all. Uh, if you're not familiar with this event, what this event will largely be is we'll be asking uh, our two guests uh, uh, many co common recruiting questions that students have. Uh, and we'll be offering their insights as to their own hiring practices and best advice for applicants. Uh, we'll have a segment where uh, our representatives will be able to talk about their own opportunities available for students with links for where you can go and who you can contact after. And then we'll have a special Q&A segment at the end for the live audience here today. If you have any questions during today's presentation, you're welcome to type them in the chat window. Uh, uh, but other than that, uh, we'll address any questions that don't come up during the presentation uh, at the very end. Uh, so for starters, uh, Kristen, if you don't mind. All right. So we're excited to dive in and learn a lot from you guys today. And the first question that we have in mind for you, Suki, is tell us a little bit about your role at Personalis and how you got started in your career. Absolutely. So I actually serve several functions for Personalis as a diversity recruiter. Part of my job is to be a sourcer. So I go out into the community, to schools, to professional organizations to find and interact with and hopefully attract diverse talent to our company through job fairs and, and college events, just, just like this one. I also am an educator and DENIB facilitator, so diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging facilitator. My purpose is to increase cultural awareness foster the development of cultural competence. And uh, I identify and advocate for policies and, and procedures that lead to more equitable outcomes for our employees and candidates. And I also serve as a recruiter. So I hire our, our interns. And uh, how I personally got started, I actually am a, I'm an immigrant from Japan, but I've lived here for most of my life right here in sunny, beautiful California. Um, Southern California girl though. <laughs> and I studied political science and received a master's degree from UCLA. And I actually started my career working as a student affairs professional. So a lot like Patrick Juan and, and Kristen uh, working in at UC, UCI and, and UCLA. Uh, but I moved to the UK and worked with the US Air Force and the United uh, Kingdom Royal Air Force, uh, came back to the States, started working in a biotech lab, uh, first as a lab technician, but eventually with the HR department. And now I'm with Personalis. And uh, throughout it all, I've always been a huge proponent of the and IB and in schools and the workplace and in society. So I've been really been able to weave that passion into every one of my jobs. I love it. Thank you so much, uh, Suki. And I, and I really applaud your company for the amount of effort you're putting into DE and I and uh, making sure you bring on a diverse workforce. That is wonderful. And also love the fact that you've had so many different careers in your lifetime, like probably many of our students will. All right, Patrick, let's go to the next question. So how can students build relevant skills and experiences for internships and jobs? Um, just curious, you know, what are your thoughts on do class projects count as experience, co-curricular activities? I'll also um, tap 
Ian in, in just a moment um, in case he has some directly applicable advice here since he is definitely within our, our science and, and tech uh, department. But uh, for internships, you can really build relevant skills through a lot of different jobs and roles. And the key is finding a way to tie what may seem to be unconnected skills and experience to the requirements of any specific role. So for instance, say that you want to do an internship in sales, but you've never sold anything before in your life. But uh, you can mention how you've been, say, a receptionist, right, at a, at a doctor's office and how you had to maintain professionalism and, and efficiency in order to continuously sell the doctor's services or, or talk about how your role as treasurer for your fraternity um, helped you hone uh, finance skills. So class projects, part-time jobs, uh, leadership and clubs, these all can provide you with relevant experience that will be noticed by a recruiter, but you really have to be able to tie that into what that job description is looking for. Now, the bar is raised, of course, when you start applying for permanent positions. There, you really want to stress you know, your internship experiences, your research maybe with professors, uh, some of the more, uh, some of the jobs that you've had, your, your papers, et cetera. So I, I'd love to also hear from Ian if, if uh, he has any advice? Sure. So the first thing I just want to share is if you don't have any skill, any experience, then you should send up a cover letter or anything that's kind of explained to it that not capture in your resume. Like example, if you want to be a scientist, but you never work in the lab, you can tell it like, you know, what inspired you to look into for the bro and tell us some relevant experience that you have, like, like you know, you use and then um, beside that, you need to tell us like uh, a little bit about like, you know, what classes that you take. If you don't have any experience, we can go through some of the classes and understand um, a lot of what you have experience in with it because you are not the only one who go to SJSU taking that class. A lot of people on the interview panel can go to the same school, understand exactly what you're going through and can say that you are like, one of the right fit candidates for us. And you, uh, I really like the fact that you guys put the code, uh, curve, uh, uh, actual activity on the resume is because like example, when I'm looking for um, it's, it's actually a role for a project manager. We actually looking for someone that, you know, who did like other like treasure role, like, you know, as a, a leading role in the school that can tie back uh, having the personality, having, you know, sometimes having the experience is good, but sometimes we're looking for people who have a personality that can fit for the team, right? Because at the end of the day, um, you are here to work on the team. So we're looking for someone who come in and uh, work harmony alongside with us. Uh, but, you know, sometimes we, we, look, we do looking for someone who stand out, but uh, most of the time depend on the interview panel. So um, it's good to sell yourself experience-wise and personality-wise uh, when you go to the interview. Thank you, Ian. Um, that is really wonderful advice. And I love that you're highlighting how important it is, not just the paid experiences that they've done during school, but you know, internships they've had, their class projects. And if uh, for any students out there who are thinking, huh, I should add that to my cover letter or I should add that to my resume, um, definitely touch base with a career counselor here at San Jose State. We have sample resumes that will help you determine how to like highlight those un unpaid skills on your, uh, on your resume. So let's move on to question number three. Uh, for either one of you guys, what are your top resume tips and most importantly, we want to know, <laughs> does an actual person ever read a resume submitted online? I'll start us off here. Let me just preface it by saying that recently we put out an internship for data science. We received over 700 applications. I looked at every single application, but and, and that's what we do. That's what we're here for. Um, that's our job. And we're always amazed by the level of skill and talent of each and every one of these candidates. But as you can imagine, with hundreds of resumes coming in, it's got to catch our eye. I mean, we are looking at four to six seconds at most uh, with, with a resume when it's bulk like that. So, you know, don't 
make sure you're only putting the things on your resume that sell you. And, and, and by that, I mean, don't fill it with descriptors of duties that you'd find on any job description, right? Like if you're talking about a job you had in in college as, uh, say, again, a, a receptionist or administrative assistant, don't say answered phones or descri- transcribed, you know, notes or waited on tables if you were a, a, a part of a wait staff. Actually tell me about accomplishments. Think about action verbs. Think about statistics. You know, I was able to raise this much money or increased efficiency by this percent. Things that make you stand out. And make sure you read that job description really well. And if you, for instance, like if like this job that I had for, for data science, if the job description says we want somebody who knows how to code in Python, make sure you've got that somewhere you can see it really easily on your resume. So actually bold Python or put it at the very top of your uh, technical skills section. Um, and uh, you know, if, if your resume is longer than two pages tops, yeah, no, it's not, it, it's not something that uh, we can spend the time really looking at. And also a, a big, huge tip, this is such a huge turnoff, I've seen cover letters which were addressed to somebody else. So to another company that they've taken the uh, a generic one um, and they had not adjusted it for for our company. So it's it's addressed to someone completely different. And at that point, yeah, I, I already know their attention to detail is just not not really good. So and lastly, take advantage of your career center because these people are absolutely at the top of their game. They know exactly what they're talking about. And they can give you so much invaluable advice. So yeah, that, that would be one of my top resume tips. And Thank you um, to both of you guys. And I love what you're saying about the importance of not just highlighting the typical duties you did, like answering the phone, but really thinking about the accomplishments. Um, that you did while you were at the job. And again, sometimes that's hard for students to come up with and you can meet with a career counselor and we'll help you um, figure out how to say that on your resume. All right, so our next question is, what are your top tips on how to uh, build a professional network? What works and doesn't work on LinkedIn? Well, I would definitely say do what you're doing now, which is attend events like this and ask a lot of questions. Uh, You can certainly ask to connect to someone on LinkedIn, um, but don't just send a connection request with no context. Um, Introduce yourself, but don't ask questions that can easily be figured out on your own. Like, do you have job openings or where do I apply? Um, And also don't be discouraged if you don't get a response. Um, It's nothing against you personally. It's just that there's a lot of people out there um, looking to connect and sometimes it's not always easy to to parse through all of them. So, um, and also, you know, whenever you network, have an elevator pitch. You should be able to answer the question, tell me about yourself in, both a a short form, like one to two minutes and a longer one, maybe four to five minutes, but something that sells yourself, uh, because that's a question that often gets asked, you know, whenever, wherever you are, whether it's in a informal meet and greet, or if it's a, you know, phone screen or, or whatever it is, make sure that you know how to sell yourself in concise language. Um, And I'd love to hear uh, what Ian might have uh, some tips. Yes, I, I think I'm going to go back to uh, question number one a little bit too. So I just want to tell you guys what major that you guys majoring right now doesn't have to be the kind of job in the next 10 years or the rest of your career. Sometimes try something that different. So I can tell you a little bit more about myself. I actually attend UC Davis as an economic major. And because I take a lot of GE classes, I fell in love with geology and natural science. And I graduated with a natural science degree. So my first job, I drilling oil in the Gulf of Mexico. And like, you know, I hate the job. I'm in the middle of nowhere, no cell phone reception, no food, no clean water. I quit after three months, but doesn't mean that I lose my passion. I'm a little bit lost in the very beginning because I didn't have anyone to guide me. But then, you know, I have background in chemistry. I was able to get a job in a chemistry department at Thermo Fisher. And then, you know, when I work, I perform, people understand my skill set. And I had um, 
a unique opportunity to work in the biochemistry. And since then, I have like, you know, uh, become a, uh, a molecular biologist. But you know, even though I'm a molecular biologist, but I take classes related to like spam of like MBA project management, like like some coding class because that's something that helped me to become a better scientist of doing my job. So one thing that I encourage you guys is even though you guys right now you guys think you guys have set my career, but sometimes you think beyond the box, like you know, even though you major in bioscience, but do you actually want to work in the lab or you want to be a project manager of something related to bioscience or do you want to do a clinical trial to be a coordinator using your molecular biology background or something, or like, you know, an auditor, like, you know, you can work for like, you know, the FDA, like, you know, it's a little bit more paperwork, but it's in the same background. If you like linguistic and molecular biology, you don't always have to work in the lab. There's so many roles open outside of the lab. Like we had like quality, regulatory, like, you know, and people were like, what is that role? You need to be a lawyer or some classic. No, you don't. You just need to have background, something related to it. And you can do a better job than you think you can be. So one of the things that I want to share, like what uh, Suki has shared, is like you re we receive so much resume. And the one that bold and the standing out is the one that we read first. Everything else we're going to read later. And sometimes when we already find a perfect candidate, we don't even go through the rest of the resume because we already found a perfect candidate, like a few perfect candidates for us. So my best advice after your name, write your objective, why do you, what are you looking for? And then you can have bullet point, right? Like, like Shuki said, if you work in science, I need you, you to have like molecular biology background, maybe PCR, NGS, sequencing, or any like teamwork, communication, bulk it out so we can see it before we go to the detail of what you do, like what you accomplish. You cannot say like, like you learn how to do pipetting. I, it, that's ir irrelevant. It's something that we're expecting you to know. It's just like write something that you want to share with that you're standing out from other candidates. And that's what we're looking for. And we actually sometimes like, you know, um, how you build a good professional network. It, this is a good place to build a good professional network. Um, you can go to go to career fair. I think you guys are gonna have a lot of career fair. That's when you guys come back to all the recruiter. Maybe they don't have a job with you right now, but it's actually up to you to reach out to them a few months later or six months later uh, to see if there is any job opening, even though there is not. Don't just say that you're only interested in that one job. Because sometimes we're like, we don't have a job for you. Is that you should ask? Is there anything else based on my skill set that I can like you know get an internship in your company? So that's what's something that um, you should do. And you know, besides career fair, there are a lot of online career fair. Like, you know, go to different schools just for fun to see like you know, in, uh, like go to Stanford to connect to people. Go to like go to an event. Like it doesn't have to be a career event. It can be like you know a, a showcase of a product and stuff. Because some of the showcase product people are looking for like you know, uh, like an employee as well. So it's not always career fair. I just I just challenge you guys to think beyond the fact of career fair and job posting online to find the job that available out there in the uh, industry, maybe to your connector, like to your, your friend, to your parent, to your professor, because like, you know, we do work with school on some different project and maybe like, you know, through that network, we can help with you with the job. Such great advice. Um, so good to hear that from the mouths of employers, the importance of, you know, don't just limit yourself to your classes, you know, what to highlight on your resume, the importance of that objective. Excellent advice. Thank you so much, you guys. So our next question is, can you share tips for successful interviewing in a virtual environment? So specifically, do nonverbal cues, dress, background screens affect your impression of candidates? I really appreciate this question because the virtual interview experience is so different. And uh, as recruiters, I think we're starting to get better at understanding uh, unique circumstances for candidates. Uh, for example, you know, candidates who may be autistic might have trouble looking at the camera all the time, or someone who is a visual learner may find it easier to write down the questions on note paper prior to answering it. 
if you need accommodations like that, don't be afraid to ask for it. Um, I am very much the type of person who, and, and I did this while I was in person. So whenever I interviewed, I have trouble you know, listening and just being able to spit out answers. I have to write the question down on a piece of paper. And, you know, when I was face to face with someone, it was fairly straightforward. I'd be writing it on my notepad and they can see that and they, they can understand that that's what I'm doing. Uh, but when I am talking to someone on camera, they just see me like doing something on the side. And so they think I might be distracted. So I tell them up front, you know, this is what I need to do in order to make sure that I'm performing at, at my best. Um, and so please be aware that, you know, X, Y, and Z, I need to do this. And like I said, don't, don't be afraid to ask for that because, you know, and if that company feels uncomfortable about that, then that's probably not a, co a company that you want to be working for anyway. This is a place you want to be able to bring your, your authentic self. Um, and, uh, but I will say that if at all possible, try to blur out your background. If there's a lot of distracting things going on, um, uh, you know, try not to interview from your bed in sweats, you know, <laughs> just things like that. I mean, we're not, we don't need you to come dressed in like a suit and, you know, and tie or things like that, but, you know, put your, put your, put your best foot forward. Um, and just, oh, one huge thing please be on time. And if that involves checking your, your tech the day before, like uh, making sure that, you know, you're able to connect to the, the Zoom link or, or whatever it is, just make sure you're, you're doing that um, prior so you don't run late. That's one of the, the biggest things I, I, I can recommend, be on time. Yeah, so I actually have something to share too. So when you guys do an interview, speak slow because sometimes when you guys get nervous, you guys speak really, really fast. And actually, the interviewer, like, we, we, we okay, but we can tell, right? So, most of the time, I'm gonna tell my, like, you know, interviewee, like, oh, why don't you get a glass of water to drink it? And then we talk about a little bit more. But remember, interview is a two way street. I interview you, you interviewing me. So, um, remember at the interview, always, you know, don't be in a very passive role. Like, you know, sometimes we're looking for a candidate who can be like, you know, a little bit more active because if, if we don't like, it's not like gel integrating and stuff. We just want to like, you know, a communication uh, between both sides. So like, you know, just relax a little bit. But then for the background, like Sufi said, like, you know, you can blur your background, it's gonna, it's gonna be the best. And please don't wear tank top because like, you know, I saw a lot, like I have one candidate wearing tank top and then we're like, oh my God, who am I dealing with right now? So, um, so yeah, so that's something that uh, I want to share with you guys. Oh, and then one of the things that I forgot, even though sometimes you don't get a full-time job rejection from the company, but one of the best way that you can show that you actually like a company asking them, do you have part-time job? Or do you have a contract position for that position that you really like, right? Because most of the time, maybe they don't consider you for a full-time job, but they can open a rec or a role for even a part-time or like, you know, a contract position because maybe you did not fit all their qualification, but they can do it for you. So again, always try to be active to get the job. Instead of when someone say no, you just ignore the email and then you say, no, nope, that's it, like, you know, be active to say like, hey, is there any, I really like the job. Is there anything else I didn't do well, but you still can consider to me to like employ in the role, like part-time position or a um, contract position for it. Thank you, both of you. Such, such good advice <laughs> there. And um, one thing I wanted to mention as a career counselor is if you didn't know, we have a career closet here at San Jose State in the Career Center and it's full of um, professional attire. And you can actually get a full outfit uh, for free um, if you come on in and we have places where you can try it on. So if you're getting ready to start your interview process and you wanna feel confident, you should definitely make an appointment with us to utilize our career closet. All right. Kristen, where can people make appointments? Uh, I believe you email um, careerhelp at sjsu.edu. Um, that would probably be your, your best way to do that. Thank you. Yeah. 
And um, as Patrick mentioned, we have a couple more questions here, but if something has sparked your interest, go ahead and put it in the chat if uh, you have your own question you'd like to ask. But on that note, um, our next one is, how does your organization support diversity and inclusion in the hiring process and development of employees of various backgrounds and experiences? Well, that's a great question. And there's kind of two different parts of that, right? So we're talking about development of recruiting practices and, and hiring practices that are inclusive. And then there's the development of employees. And so let me go at it from the recruiting perspective. Uh, so I am a diversity recruiter. It's a position that was created for exactly this type of hiring in mind, which is um, being an inclusive uh, interviewer, being, um, you know, developing streamlining practices for standardized interview processes so that we are doing the same thing for each candidate, not that different people aren't getting a different experience so that we can measure it all in um, a, a standardized way. Um, being aware of the language that's used when we talk to candidates. I mean, you know, the sound of your, your name, they say, is like the sweetest, sweetest sound. And so if people aren't pronouncing it correctly, then it's, it's jarring. And it, you know, it makes you feel like you're not, um, you're not being heard, or you're not being um, recognized. And so, you know, just making sure that our recruiters are aware of the language they're using, um, how they approach, you know, interviews, like exactly what I was talking about, how there, there are sometimes when we should be making modifications to the actual, you know, interface. So if somebody again is um, uh, autistic or, or is neurodiverse, maybe they don't want to be staring directly into the camera. Um, or you know, when we were in in uh, in person, maybe someone who is of uh, um, you know is, is devout Muslim and they're female, they may not want to shake hands with a male interviewer. Just having these things in mind, educating our, our recruiters that this is the reality of, of a diverse society and we want people from diverse backgrounds and talents to come and join us, then we have to be sensitive and we have to be, you know, making it a, a, an inclusive process. And also, you know, making sure that our qualifications aren't making it hard for people to apply. They say that, uh, you know, for women and people from underserved and uh, underrepresented minorities, they tend not to apply for a position unless they meet 100% of the qualifications. Whereas, um, you know, white males may apply um, when they only meet 60% of the qualifications. And so right there from the get-go, the resume and the, the interview hiring recruitment process is already skewed. And so making sure that when we're putting out qualifications that we're only asking for the very basic qualifications and recognizing transferable skills and recognizing transferable experiences. And uh, from a, a DEI, uh, you know, a development of employees of various backgrounds and experiences, we do have a, a diversity and uh, inclusion committee, which Ian and I serve on. And we're there to spread, you know, cultural awareness, cultural um, education, and promote cultural competence. We can't just learn about each other. We need to be able to speak with each other, to work with each other um, from a place of empathy and inclusion. So at the end of the day, we feel Feel like everyone um, belongs that people can can bring their like I said the authentic self to work and it's it's very much a work in progress it's it's not nearly perfect we've got a lot of things we need to do um, but we are we are pushing it every single day and that's something we will continue to do great thank you and actually we've we've, we've even had some really good questions come through in the the chat and I'd love to get your guys's opinions on this um, the first one is that you know, the students realize having a network, a professional network is so important, but they sometimes feel that it's very, very hard to get directly in contact with the hiring manager or, or the recruiter. So do you have any tips on how to specifically network with those type of people? In terms of getting connected to your recruiter, and I'll let 
may Ian um, talk uh, if he has some uh, other ideas about getting in touch with hiring managers. But, uh, you know, for a lot of these positions that are on LinkedIn or, or whatever the the platform might be, it does state somewhere in there who that recruiter might be. So go ahead, look them up on um, LinkedIn um, and send them a message. But again, don't just send it out of context. Sending them a connection request that has no background to it whatsoever isn't going to help you at all. Um, so make sure you're saying, hey, you know, I'm applying for this. Just wanted to let you know, please consider me. Um, but don't give them too much to do. Right. So don't don't say, OK, I need you to get back to me and, and let me know X, Y and Z. And it's not because they don't want to pay attention to you. They do. But there's a lot of things coming at them fast and furious, as you can imagine, during this time. It's it's a great time for to be an um, uh, empl uh, employment seeker because there's a lot of jobs on the market. It's really hard um, on the other other um, side sometimes because we're we're searching for people and we're trying to do we're trying to fill a lot of positions at one time so again it's not that we want to ignore you we're not we're not trying to at all um, but you know sometimes it may fall through the cracks so have some uh, patience for us please um, and, uh, and a little bit of grace but if you if you put some context to your request we will more than likely accept it and uh, send a note back uh, Ian any any ideas Yes, so for me, um, I, like I share with you guys, I, I graduated with a different major and I employed with a different major. My first approach for me to get an attention from a recruiter is I share my resume with a, contact, uh, with a re, uh, contracting agency. And that's one of the best ways for the con uh, contracting agency to work with other big companies to get me a job. So technically, I kind of do my job and the recruiter from different contracting company help me get the employee from the job. And you know, the moment you have the experience, it's actually going to be easier for you to get a full-time job from other company as well. And, um, you know, about, like, you know, entry level and recruiter ignoring you, like Suki said, it just, we receive so much resume. It just, for one row, sometimes we receive like 100 applicants. And of course, we're looking for someone that suitable more for us. It's not like we don't like entry level because some of the position that I hire, I'm looking for people who had no experience. Like, like for my, I'm just gonna speak for someone in uh, with science background. So when we do formulation, right, we're looking for someone who had no experience to follow the SOP. And we want someone who had no experience to like, you know, follow the SOP. But um, since we're talking about that, so this is a net, great network to, um, to find an entry-level job. So if you guys can, if anyone in sign want to connect with me after this meeting, I might have a position opening up maybe soon that for an entry-level. So see, like, you know, you don't know when, where you can get a connection. So this is one of the best ways that we can go for it. Thank you. That is great. You guys, you guys heard it. Is that they're willing to share their ideas and and open to that. So that is wonderful. And actually, that leads into my very uh, our final question: Is are you actively hiring <laughs> right now? Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about what you're looking for. Let me uh, say a little bit about the positions that we are hiring. We are actively hiring right now for a bioinformatics intern. Uh, so that's something that uh, we're, we're really happy to, to get out there. So please do um, on the last, I think, slide, uh, may our information is there, but you can always just look up personalis. It's just personalis.com. I don't know if you can see it behind me. Personalis, P-E-R-S-O-N-A-L-I-S.com. And if you go to our career section, you can see under internships, there is a bioinformatics internship. Um, for those graduating this spring with a bachelors who have some experience, say, in a biology lab course, maybe a, a STEM major, those wanting to go into biotech. We have opportunities as lab assistants, lab associates in our next generation sequencing lab. Um, we also have a bioinformatics analyst role for those graduating soon um, with, say, a master's degree in computer science um, or related field. We also have software engineering roles. And if you want to 
express interest in a career with us but can't find the right role right away, uh, please apply for our specific position that says, don't see a position that fits your skills, apply anyway, job posting. And that puts you in our pipeline. Like Ian was saying, it allows us to go back um, when a position does come up um, and uh, we can search it with keywords and things like that. And we're like, oh, this person might now might be perfect for a position that's open that will be open in a month, right? And then we can go back and contact them. So, Ian? Yes, we are actually, we are growing, so we are actually hiring. And again, I think one of the uh, comments in the chat about do we have to be as a major? Again, we don't always looking for the major, we're looking for the keyword that connecting us to the job description, right? So again, if you are, like software, but if you apply for biotech company, yes, we do have software, but software, do you like automation? Do you like bioinformatics? Or you want overall networking, IT, something related to it, you need to list it out so we can screen and we filter for it, right? But if you just focus on only on your major and using a very limited word, it's just gonna limit yourself from all the job opening that we have it for you. So again, if you can make your resume more diverse, at the same time, more telling for very job specific, you can have multiple resume, right? But again, make you stand out from, for us so we can hire you. It's just if your resume is buried underneath of all the resume that had a keyword and standing out, there is nothing that can, we can help you with that. Because even though we try to remember you, but we human, right? We have a lot of things coming every single day. So make us remember you from your resume perspective. Great. Um, I think we're, we're getting to the last few minutes here. So um, Patrick, I'm going to hand this over to you to facilitate the rest. Sure thing. So th thank you all for your questions so far. We have a dedicated segment where if uh, you want to tell more students about uh, personalis uh, and and refer students to more details and further resources on where they can go to apply and what opportunities we have. Like you said, we have those links at the end, right? Yeah. Wonderful. So Ian, would you mind starting out um, telling them a little bit about uh, what we do from a more technical standpoint? So from technical standpoint, I can tell you a little bit more about um, our company. So our actually, our company is a sequencing uh, company. We are doing NGS, which stands for next generation sequencing that you guys do. So in the market right now, NGS is the best way to go because not only that we sequence your whole genome with everything your parent is giving you, we can learn more about you, but we're using that technology to understand how do you have cancer, where, and um, how, do, how do you cancer, and how do we treat your cancer. So at personally, that's what we are trying to do right now. So if, on, if you go to our website, we have new platform that we try to um, Launch already launched. You only have one sample, one workflow, but we can tell you multiple biomarker because biomarker means you have a lot of gene in your body that uh, you don't know, we don't know, but we just want to sequence your data to see that you know some of the gene you are inherit or you develop um, in your lifetime. Would that be the cause of your cancer? And when we have that gene, we can buy the drug or the therapy that can match that. That, that, that can match that gene and can fix the problem that you have in the disease standpoint. So that's what we're doing at Personalist. It's actually a um, very, very challenging technology, but we make it work and we are happy to recruiting more people to make it to be the best next level. So I, I mean, like I just try to summarize this easy to the people who don't understand science so they can understand as well. So. So in a very simple term, A, we help you finding out what gene of cancer do you have, and we will try our best to find a drug that can fix the problem that you have. That's it. Thanks, <laughs> Ian. Patrick, would you mind going to the, yeah, just go through that real quick. Thank you. So this is actually a snapshot of our workflow. And so we're receiving these samples and we enter them into our lab information management system. We track them. We determine tumor content of a sample, um, extract DNA, RNA, uh, do library preps, quality checks, sequence the, the data. Uh, that data enters our bioinformatics pipeline, um, gets analyzed, reports are generated, data is delivered, and, and 
we've reviewed with our clients. So uh, basically we have job opportunities at multiple spots um, during this workflow, as well as in sales, business development, administrative, financial, and human resources support departments. And, you know, it, it, we can't do this job without the amazing staff, like our advanced genomic sequencing and, and analytics um, solutions that support the development of, of the personalized immunotherapies and potentially even cancer vaccines. This can't happen without the staff. So our single greatest contributing factor to success is our talented team. And since our mission is to transform the development of next generation personalized therapies by providing more comprehensive molecular data about each patient, you know, the, the same core principles apply to our company. And so our, our stand on DEI is that just as we recognize the uniqueness of each patient, we recognize that each employee has a distinct perspective and we want you to bring that to the company. And so that's that's why DEI is, is so important um, to us. And I know I, I I was reviewing in my head when I said, you know, that it's it's easy being a em, employment seeker right now in the market. That's not true. It's it's never easy to be an employment seeker in any market. I totally get that. Um, sometimes it can take months, it can take years to land that job. And it is very, very difficult. Um, so, you know, it, I applaud everyone who, who's going through that. Absolutely, though, take advantage of your career center. I, I spent so much time in the early part of my career uh, or, you know, job search, not taking advantage of that, of that service. And once I did, it changed things for me so much because now I knew how to interview. Now I knew how to write a resume. Now I knew how to connect with people. Um, what kind of job opportunities um, were available to me with transferable skills. Um, so please do this is, you know, Kristen and, and Patrick and Juan didn't ask me to, to push this, but I'm saying from my personal experience, take advantage of your career center. I just want to talk about a little bit about transferable skill. Hey, for a lot of you don't know what a transferable skill, we're looking for someone who learned Microsoft presentation, Excel and Doc. It kind of like, you know, sometimes when you go to work, we just give you a document and you told me you don't know how to do presentation. It's going to be a real red flag for us, right? Maybe like communication, how to write proper email. So those transferable skills are actually very helpful when you employ a job. Yeah, because you don't have it, it's actually going to make the job a little bit uh, harder like yeah that, that pretty much like hard skill and soft skill yes we already soft skill at work as well yes all of those are really important so please check out some of our uh, summer 2022 internships um, our human resources operations uh, one has pretty much almost concluded. Bioinformatics is, is full in, in full swing, so please do check us out. Again, if there's something online that, that speaks to you, but you haven't been, uh, like if there's a department that speaks to you, but there's no job, please do apply for that. Uh, you know, don't see a perfect fit, but apply here. Um, and there's career opportunities for new grads. Please feel free to reach out to me directly. There's my email right there. You can connect to my LinkedIn page. Um, and then our personalis website is also there as well. So thank you so much um, for having us here today. Really appreciate it. Thank you as well. I'm putting in the chat here a couple of those uh, links and references just, just for people to uh, copy for their own records, making sure I wrote that down, right? That looks like it, great. Um, so, uh, so, so I uh, actually have a message from a person named uh, Punit Sundar about if you have a major in computer, com, computational background in bioinformatics, but want to learn about wet lab research, it's actually very easy. Talk to your manager to see like, you know, for your program, can you dedicate 70% of your job in bioinformatics, but 30% in the other department? Most of the time your manager will say yes, as long as you com, uh, complete your job. Like, you know, just like, you know, do your job 80, 20 or 70, 30, most of people will say yes, if that's an internship position, because at the end of the day, we want you to work at, walk out of the company being a happy man and recommend more people to come in and internship with us. Not say that you got a very hard to work with, we don't, we don't want to recommend anybody to work with you. So yeah, just speak with the manager and they will definitely can help you with that. 
that Thank actually, you very much. Oh, yeah. yeah, that speaks to everything um, with our jobs. D you know, apply, ask questions because the worst thing we're going to say is no. Yes. Great points. Thank you very much. Uh, that is uh, essentially the end of everything that has been pre-scheduled for today's event. Uh, what remains is now a Q&A with uh, all of the attending students today. Uh, we've had some great questions in the chat window, uh, and I hadn't properly introduced them uh, previously. I have my associate Juan Vasquez, who's been helping monitor the chat and help uh, run today's event behind the scenes here. Um, it, he's been seeing like, a few questions posted in the chat and will help us with facilitating questions moving forward, including questions that might not have been answered previously. Um, but it, now's the perfect time. If you have an unanswered question or maybe a follow-up question to a previous one, please type it in the chat. You're also welcome to raise your hand. We can call on you and you can uh, address your question directly to the presenters here. Um, while we're getting that ready, I'm gonna uh, highlight one last thing. We do have a survey link that we ask that you fill out uh, today. Uh, this helps us run uh, the types of events that you want to see. If you really appreciated Personalis's attendance today and want to see more of them, please let us know or let, let us know if you want to see more employers like Personalis attending for future events. Uh, and if you have negative feedback, we want to hear that too. <laughs> but I'm going to go back to this slide because I think this is going to have the details that many students uh, have an interest in seeing. And we have the survey link already in the chat window. Um, Juan, by any chance, do we get some questions that we might have missed early in the presentation? Um, no, I don't see, you know, how to contact the career center. Uh, okay, here we go. Um, I got a question that says, how can we pass the, uh, the technical questions for, uh, bio bioinformatics internship? Uh, can you narrow down the topic? Like coding questions or data analysis questions? Ian? <laughs> so I'm not from bioinformatics, but I'm working with people from bioinformatics, right? First of all, we want to know um, uh, what hard skills that you have. Do you use jump view, Python, you use script? What language do you use to understand the big data? So the next thing is now you have big data. What, like, are you using SQL, using Jump, using Python to present the data to us? And like, you know, the technical question, it depends on the, uh, the manager gonna ask you the technical question, but you need to understand what type like this company using for it. If you don't have that information, that information when you ask in the recruiter, the, you can ask the recruiter to ask the manager about it and you can prepare yourself before you come into the interview route, because you say the first route is recruiter gonna talk to you, the second round the manager gonna talk to you. So if you have concerns, speak with a recruiter and the recruiter can set you up um, with the manager pre-hand or some of the, if the recruiter possible can answer some of the questions for you on a technical um, hard skill before you can, uh, before you speak with the manager. Is that correct, Suki? To an extent, I, I would say um, make sure that uh, you're really reading that job description because that'll be your biggest clue. So if it says like we need you to have skills in coding in, I, I don't know, Java or whatever it be, it'll be in the job description. Um, so that's where you'll get your, your first um, taste of uh, what it is that we're looking for. And then one of the things I if you are not familiar with the thing you put on your resume, don't put it because most of the time we will ask the thing that you put on your resume. And if you put on your resume and we're asking you and you don't know how to answer it, you say, I only do it once. It's a very big flag for us, like, you know, and then we will drill you more on the thing that you put on your resume. So, yeah. Thank you. I wanted to address like an earlier question that I saw that was regarding um, etiquette with follow-up emails, because that's that's inevitable for anyone going through the application process. Uh, what are some tips that you might recommend for that follow-up email? How do you say stay cordial and polite while also uh, like requesting the information you're looking for? It's totally okay to reach out to your recruiter and uh, say, hey, you know, I was wondering if you had any updates. That's totally fine. And in fact, you know, it's it's encouraged if you've passed a certain deadline. So for example, your recruiter said, hey, I will get back to you by next Friday. And it's after next Friday and over the weekend, you're like, wait, I never heard from them. Yeah, 
definitely send us an email. Um, I, the best way to get a response though, is make sure that you're putting it in, uh, please just, you know, respect goes absolutely both ways. Your recruiter should be respectful enough of you to speak with you, um, get a respectful tone, address you respectfully, you know, and uh, meet the deadlines as they 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 laid out. Um, but it, in you know, it's not a perfect world. Sometimes the recruiter will mistake will make mistakes. Sometimes the the applicant will make mistakes. Um, so it's always as long as we ground it in civility. Um, the one thing I do ask that you don't do is ask, hey, can I get an update? If we told you that we're going to get you an update by next Friday and it's next Tuesday, eh. <laughs> right? So just because it's it's not going to be helpful for, for anyone. Um, and also, you know, if you ask the question, can you give me feedback on why um, I didn't get selected for, for a job? It's something that oftentimes we would love to be able to tell you more, but there are legal reasons why sometimes we can't do that. Um, there's, you know, there's a, a whole host of reasons why that may not be possible. So, you know, if we say, unfortunately, we can't, you know, answer that question um, as, as disappointing as it is, I've been on the other side of that too. I've asked recruiters, hey, can you tell me? And they just weren't able to tell me. It's really disappointing, but sometimes, unfortunately, we, we just can't. Thank you very much. Uh, Juan, do we get uh, any more questions in the chat? Uh, yes. Uh, how do you transfer your uh, clinical skills to business skills, switching from healthcare to business with no experience? There's actually, I mean, uh, you know, just you have to be really creative. I, from someone who came from, so I, I came from a, a political science background. I went into a uh, biotech or I'm sorry, I went into student affairs and then I went into biotech and then I went into recruiting. So I've been all over the place. The only reason why I've been able to make it work is because I will look at a job description. I will look at, okay, so this is what they need me to be able to do more on a soft skill basis, right? So, uh, and, and then I just convert that into whatever it is that I've done that allows me to meet those requirements and then really talk about that. So if you're coming from, um, you know, wet lab, say you've had to do a lot of things that required extreme attention to detail, right? You've had to work with um, SOPs. You've had to work cross-functionally in teams. You have to be able to meet um, fast turnaround times with uh, extreme efficiency and accuracy. I mean, all these things are soft skills that would be required in a lot of different um, industries, including business. So you just have to be able to tease that out. Did that Perfect. Hello, Suki. Hi, uh, this is Mercy here. I have a question regarding uh, the bioinformatics analyst role. So um, I'm, a, uh, I'm graduating in spring 22 as a master's uh, of uh, data analytics. I'm pursuing my data analytics. I see uh, one of the roles that could match is the bioinformatics analyst, but then are you looking specifically for the bioinformatics part of it too, or just specific tools or just the analyst part of it? Why don't you go ahead um, and send me an email so we can just go a little bit more in detail separate from from this. Sure. Um, and then we can we can discuss it a little further. But definitely. Yeah, would love to would love to hear more. Awesome. And there's another opportunity that I found on the careers page. Can I reach out to you regarding that, too? Sure. I may okay. end up um, pointing you at a, a different recruiter just because that's not m usually my area of expertise. But that's that's the thing that we can always do. Right. Is even if the person you reach out to isn't the perfect point of contact sure. for whatever your question is, we can always direct you to someone who is. Okay, thank you so much, Suki. I really appreciate it. Sure. So do I'm starting to this. Uh, do I have to be a certain major in order to apply for this internship? I'm sorry, was the question, do you have to be of a certain major to apply for that internship? 
Yeah. yeah. Um, no, uh, but uh, if you look at the job description, it will say um, even if you don't have a bioinformatics background, um, it's encouraged that you're from STEM and that you have experience with a couple of the things that's that's listed there. I think it's a uh, you know some experience with coding um, and uh, uh, so yeah, just look at the job description again. Just like I said, the worst we're gonna do is say no. <laughs> so it's it never hurts to try. Thank you. Sure. I'm going to address that we're coming up on the end of the hour here. And so we may not have time to answer everyone's questions here. So I just put in the chat for everyone, if we didn't get to your question today, or if you have like a very specific or personal question, maybe related to your own personal circumstances or goals in the application process, um, or we encourage you to connect with Suki either via email or LinkedIn. Uh, and we want to thank Suki again for providing that, that information. Uh, our students always appreciate having that sort of connection. Um, to the recruiters rather than just saying, you know, here's an application in this broad ATS uh, uh, system. Um, I'm going to address like the last question here, if that's all right, one that was, um, what do you recommend if a, a recruiter hasn't exactly provided like a timeline for an update? What would be the best way to approach that sort of follow up? You can always reach out to your recruiter if they haven't told you, you know, a, a specific date, just send them an email and say, hey, I am, I, I interviewed for this. Um, I just want to get an update. Um, it's always okay to reach out to a recruiter. Um, just, you know, be mindful that they may not be able to get back to you immediately. Again, it's not that they don't care because most of them do. <laughs> um, it's just that there's a lot of things going on and we've got hundreds of applications. So, um, you know, I, I know it's really hard because applying for jobs is just really, really stressful and really just, you know, sometimes it can be overwhelming, but um, we, we beg you for a little bit of patience. Um, and I promise you that the more patient you are with us, the better impression you're giving us. Um, of your flexibility and your adaptability, and that makes you a, a stellar candidate, trust me. Wonderful. Uh, I think that's going to con conclude today's Employer Insights for today's event. I want to thank Suki and Ian for uh, attending today, for offering these terrific uh, insights. I have like a full page of like notes that I just like uh, took uh, on, on the event. Uh, I think a lot of the information has been helpful to our students. I want to thank Juan Vasquez for helping with uh, moderate the chat for today, and Kristen, who unfortunately had to head off to another appointment today, but she wanted to express her thanks for all the attendees today and for the personalist representatives. Students are already posting in the chat their thank yous. Um, for for any for just the last steps for today, I want to remind people, um, please check the survey link in the chat window. Um, it helps us run events similar to what uh, what today's. Uh, we also have the check-in form. That's just a very quick three. A three field form for you to fill out the, that's important for our records uh, for uh, for attendance. And and just that last reminder uh, to connect with Suki, please uh, email her or connect with her on LinkedIn. And with Thanks that, I think we're going to include. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming, you guys. Thank Bye -bye. you.